Hey, what's up guys, Kosti here. And in today's video, I'm going to be covering four of the most instructive Rook end games that I've ever seen. These are examples that I'm often uh, showing my students. And I basically think everyone should know these. Everyone should see these games and see some of these high level strategies that can show up in all kinds of different Rook end games. So we're basically gonna be talking about positions with a single pair of Rooks on the board, obviously Kings and then multiple pawns. I'm not really gonna be discussing a lot of theoretical rook end games so positions with very very few pawns on the board like your lucina position or your philidor position if you're interested in that though i'll leave a link in the description uh, to something that can help you uh, learn more about those theoretical end games but for now we're going to be talking about some of the best played rook end games of all time by some of the best players of all time. And I'm sure some of you guys have probably seen a lot of these examples um, before, but I doubt everyone has seen all of them. So this video is, is for you guys. I think these are, again, games that I think everyone should uh, learn and study. And of course, there'll be a link in the description where you can play through uh, all of the games at your own pace. All right, so with that, let's get into the video. So our first example here comes from the game Marshall Shigorin. And what I really found impressive about this one is, um, first of all, Black traded down to get into this rook end game with equal material. Uh, and here Shigorin doesn't play the really obvious rook c3 check, which seems like it just picks up uh, the a3 pawn, giving Black two connected passers on the queen side. Now, normally having two connected pass pawns in a rook end game is really, really strong because the pawns can support each other. But in this case, after rook c3, why would play king e4, rook takes a3, and white could play a move like rook to c2, or maybe even king to d5, and basically get a ton of counterplay in this position. So even though white is a pawn down, his pass d pawn is actually gonna be pretty strong here. And when the rook comes into the seventh rank, black is gonna have some issues defending the pawns or keeping the king active. Now this is going to be a theme that comes up a lot in this video. King activity is one of the most important things in rook end games. King activity is basically important in all single piece end games for the simple reason that you have two pieces left on the board and if you want to be successful both of them need to be active. But in this case it's white's rook that's going to be the more active rook and white's king that's going to be the more active king. So instead of immediately grabbing this pawn, Shigorin first plays king to e6, planning to bring his king to the crucial d5 square. And this is kind of like a, a pretty simple idea, just this idea of activating the king, but a lot of players don't realize the importance. And here black shows that this is actually worth more than this one pawn on a3. A lot of times it's better to strengthen your position first rather than spending a lot of time grabbing some material. Here if white plays king e4, black will just play f5 check and force white's king back. So instead white played rook to b3, defending the third rank, black goes king to d5, and white plays rook d3, defending the d4 pawn. And now black just starts advancing and pushing f5. And the problem for white here is that the rook and the king are both tied down to this d pawn, the rook is also tied down to the third rank here, defending the a pawn. And what that means is if the rook starts shuffling back and forth, let's say rook to d2, well now black will be able to play rook c3 check, Forcing white to play rook to d3, going back with the king would not be great at all. Now black takes, has won a pawn, and white has zero activity here as black's king is really strong. Instead, white would probably have to play rook to d3 in order to defend, but now black can go for the king and pawn endgame where the rook takes d3, king takes d3, and after a5, what's happening here is that black is going to have an outside pass pawn and is winning this endgame. So very simple sample line, let's say king to c3. Black can go ahead and push b4 here, giving up the pawn on b4 in order to be able to take the pawn on d4. And this is a very basic uh, thing about king and pawn endgames. Whichever king is closer, even if it's by one tempo, is going to be winning the battle here. Black's king simply walks in and is going to be taking all of white's pawns and black is completely winning here. So in view of the fact that this endgame is winning, this makes things really, really difficult for white. Now any king and pawn endgame is gonna be losing for white for the same reason, black having the outside pass pawn, very important uh, asset in these kinds of endgames. And that means that white's rook simply can't move off the third rank as this would allow a rook trade and black would have an easily winning king and pawn endgame. So a really important point to understand about rook endgames, again, you can generalize this to basically all endgames. It's very crucial to understand 
who exactly is going to be winning the king and pawn endgame, or if it's going to be a draw. Because it's really important to know whether you should be trying to trade off your last piece, or whether you need to be avoiding the trade at all costs. Here, white definitely needs to avoid the rook trade, as the king and pawn endgame is just going to be trivial for black. And because of this, it means that the rook is not going to be able to stay on d3 forever. The rook is going to have to move away, and white won't be able to kind of hold this defensive fortress for very long. So black goes f5, and now the idea is simply to run white out of moves. If the rook moves along the third rank, black can safely take on d4, and if the rook moves backwards, then of course black comes in with rook c3 check. So white here plays h3, now black just goes h5, and this is a matter of running out the clock. The rook can also swing over to a4, which basically means that black is never running out of moves here, and it's only a matter of time before we reach Zugzwang, another really important theme. Zugzwang is a position where basically all legal moves make your position worse. If white could just hold this position with the rook on d3 and not have to touch anything, it'd actually be pretty difficult for black to break through, but the fact that white has to make a move means that he has to give up some ground and black can take advantage of this. So at this point, white decides to go ahead and give up the pawn with king to e2. He could have continued to stall with a move like h4, but Shigorin probably uh, calculated already that he's going to have this move g6, among other moves. And finally, it's uh, Zugzwang here. White has to make a move and lose some pawn or give up some ground. So instead, Marshall goes king to e2, just giving up the d4 pawn on the spot. Uh, plays for rook c3, trying to activate at least in some way. But now rook e4 check, king goes to d2, and really nice move here by black h4, breaking down uh, the pawns on g3 and f4 after rook c7 takes on g3, rook takes g7, black takes on f4, rook takes g3. We've traded off a couple of pawns, but black has been left with an extra pawn here, and with the more active king, more active rook, uh, and very strong past f pawn, black was able to win this one pretty smoothly. Now, I'm not going to go through uh, the full endgame here. I think the most instructive part of this one was just the fact that black uh, focused on centralizing the king before going after the material and trying to win some pawns. But if you guys want to check out the full end game, I would strongly recommend you play through it. Uh, I'll leave a link to all the games in the description below. The next game here is probably the most famous of the bunch. I bet a lot of people um, have seen this one, so I won't spend too much time uh, going over it. But I do just want to uh, highlight the critical idea here. This is the game Capablanca Tardicower. This is, I think, one of Capablanca's most famous games. He was known for being not just an amazing player, but an amazing endgame player in particular. And this example really highlights the importance and the power of king activity. So here, white facing the problem of rook takes c3, which not only wins the pawn, but also forces the king backwards uh, as black's pawns are covering all of the key entry squares. Facing this issue, Capablanca comes up with basically an ingenious solution. He goes king to g3 and simply prepares to advance the king up the board. Now, it looks really simple. It looks like such an obvious move when you think about it, but I can't tell you guys how many students, you know, I've shown this position to, and king to g3 is simply not on their radar. King activity is not something that we're often thinking about, but it's something that we should be thinking about whenever we get this kind of endgame. King activity is one of the most important things. And this turns out to be basically the, the only good move for white in the position. After rook takes c3, king to h4, now the plan is to simply walk in with the king, either uh, via the h5 square, king h5, king to g6, and start uh, creating mating threats against black's king, or by using the g-pawn with pushing to g6 and stepping through with king g5, king f6, which is actually even a faster route. Uh, so here black goes rook to f3, white pushes g6, and of course the key difference here is that white's king is active. Black's king is not only stuck on the back rank, but is also a liability, because once white's king gets in front of Black's king on f8, there's going to be all kinds of mating threats as well. So it's not just about the king being passive, the king is actually going to have uh, threats from white uh, upon it. So black goes rook takes f4, check, picking up another pawn. Black is now two pawns up, but white is coming in, king to g5, and the king is headed to f6. Uh, and now black plays rook e4, trying to at least defend somewhat. If rook takes d4, then the king would walk into f6, and now these mating threats on the back rank are really annoying to deal with. For example, after king to g8, white would not play rook takes c7, which would actually just allow black to defend for a little while longer with rook to c4 covering the critical c8 square, but actually white would go rook d7. And because black's rook isn't able to uh, hit the back rank, black is actually just getting mated here. There's simply no defense to, to rook d8. 
Uh, if the king tries to run uh, this way with king e8, well then white's g pawn is simply going to promote. White can push g7 here, white can take on c7 first, grab a couple of pawns, but eventually this g pawn is running and black simply won't be able to stop it. Uh, g7, king d8 for example, rook takes a7, followed by giving check and promoting the pawn on the back rank, and that's going to be game. White's extra rook should decide. So here black plays rook to e4 so that the rook can at least defend the back rank and, and black can avoid getting checkmated. Now white comes in with king to f6, king to g8, rook g7 check. I really like this check because it forces the king to either go to the corner or to f8 where it can run into uh, white pushing g7 as well as uh, some back rank meaning ideas. So white first gives this check, black gives uh, plays king to h8, and now rook takes c7. And again, black's king is uh, about to get mated, so black has to go super passive with the rook, super passive with the king. Uh, and now, very simple play by Capablanca. He simply takes this f-pawn. Now that the f-pawn might be uh, in danger of starting to run, he grabs this one, and we can see that white's advantage has become extremely clear. Material is now equal, but the king is still super active. The g-pawn still has to be defended against, and of course, the rook is also extremely active on the seventh rank. Uh, black tried rook to e4, king comes back to f6 to reinstate the threat, rook f4 check, and now very simple transfer king to e5, and white decides he doesn't have to win the game on the king side, in fact this would be very hard, black can defend against this one pawn, instead the king is headed towards the queen side where white is going to be able to use uh, the d pawn. So rook g4, g7 check, king uh, g8, rook takes a7, and that's basically game over. Black's pieces are tied down to this g-pawn, and the king is going to be taking uh, the d-pawn and then just walking the d-pawn up the board with a very simple win. Number three, guys, another pretty well-known one, especially if you've studied any uh, classic endgame books, they uh, always like to use this position. But th again, this is an endgame I think everyone should know, so we're absolutely going to include it. This is the game Botvinnik, Bolt, Slavsky, uh, very, very simple rook endgame. White has uh, three pawns, one extra pawn, including this pass pawn on the queen side. And uh, these are positions that are always very, very tricky to, to play for both sides. There's tons and tons of different ideas here. Um, but I, hopefully I can give you guys some guidance as to what you're kind of playing for when you have this extra pawn and you're trying to uh, convert it. And this is kind of considered the classic example um, of, of this endgame because it kind of shows uh, all three faces uh, of the rook. When we have an extra pass pawn and we can decide where to put the rook, we always have a choice. We can put the rook behind the pawn or we can defend uh, the pawn from the side or even from behind by giving check and going uh, rook to b8 here. Uh, now here Botvinnik decides correctly, he puts the rook behind the pass pawn. This is a well-known concept, I'm sure many people have heard this, but this game really illustrates uh, the power of keeping the rook behind uh, the pawn whenever we can. Now of course in the immediate position rook to e4 would be a tragic blunder because rook c1 it would just be a mate threat, but white could have played a move like h3 allowing black to get behind the pawn and I often see this in rook end games uh, and then white tries something like rook to e4 or even rook e8 check and getting to behind. But I really wanna make it clear for you guys, um, all else being considered, the best spot for our rook is behind the pawn. If we can't get there, the next best is to be to the side of the pawn. The reason for this is that when you defend the pawn from the side, it's hard to push the pawn, but at least your rook is a lot more mobile. And the worst spot for the rook, which actually ends up being the most common, uh, is getting the rook behind the pass pawn. And the reason why this one is not as good as the other two is that simply the rook is tied down to the pawn and not really doing anything uh, on the back rank. Eventually white will push the pawn all the way up to b7, but as long as black's king remains careful and doesn't allow any uh, unfortunate checks, the rook is simply going to be stuck behind the pawn, and black's rook on b2 is going always going to be able to be super, super active, defending against all possible threats and putting pressure on white's uh, king side. So this is something that I really can't stress enough. Whenever you get the chance, whether you're the attacking side, you have the extra pawn, or you're the defending side, you're defending against the extra pawn, the priority should be to get the rook behind the past pawn. Um, so let's see how this one plays out because this one I think was really, really instructive. White goes rook to b1. Now in general, as a defender, I think it's recommended to immediately get in front of the pawn as quickly as you can. The reason for this is that if you let white just push the pawn too much, eventually you're just not gonna be able to stop it and the rook is gonna get stuck on b8. So I think the best chance for black would have been to play rook to c6 here 
and then after b5, at least stop the pawn on the sixth rank with rook to b6. Instead, black first plays king f7. I don't think it changes the evaluation too much. Uh, white has amazing winning chances here. He pushes b5, he pushes b6. Now black goes rook to c8. And here it's very important that white doesn't exactly push the pawn all the way to b7, because now this is a matter of counting, a matter of tempos. The problem for black is basically this is an outside pass pawn. And just like we see in king and pawn endgames, the difficulty here is that black has to spend time going after this pawn, which gives white time to bring in his king on the king side and go after black's king side pawns. So rather than spending too much time pushing b7, here Botvinnik just plays h3 and he starts advancing his king up the board. So rook b8, king h2, king d5, king g3, king c6, king g4, and here we see white's idea and we see black's issue. After rook takes b6 here, white gladly goes into the king and pawn endgame. Again, we see the importance of knowing which king and pawn endgames are going to be winning and which ones are not. But here white's king is again closer and can go after black's king side pawns and uh, easily wins the game. So because black cannot take on b6, that means black is kind of stuck dealing with this pawn. And again, we saw this uh, theme in the first example. We saw this theme in the second example as well. And here again, we kind of see this idea where the pieces are tied down to this pass pawn. Um, so here black goes king to b7. And I would say this next move is probably the most important move of the whole game. I would say it's the most instructive, the one that would probably be the hardest to find for anyone you know, trying to play this game or recreate it uh, themselves. Here Botvinnik goes rook to e1. So this move is, is truly brilliant for, uh, I think because actually it works on, on two levels. Uh, number one, it's a very, very good strategic decision. At this point with Black's King blockading our pawn, the rook on uh, the B file doesn't really do a whole lot for white. This rook on the B file is, getting, is good against putting pressure against Black's rook. Against the king, our pawn is just blockaded and Black's rook is actually free to activate itself once the king is on B7. So white here takes the time to actually transfer his rook to the e6 square, which strategically is a great decision because here his rook on e6 is going to be holding the pawn and also contributing to a potential battle on the king side. Very easy for white to go after the pawns. But this move also works on a tactical level because obviously the pawn is just hanging and <laughs> so many players wouldn't dare to leave this pawn hanging. This is the pride of white's position. But of course, the tactical justification is that white will swing back, rook to b1 check, king to c7, rook takes b8, king takes b8, trading into the king and pawn endgame, where of course white just has an easy route to victory. So I actually think, I mean, this game is famous for white playing rook b1 earlier, you know, putting the rook behind the passed pawn, very textbook. But I think this is the real star move of the game. This is the move that a lot of players would struggle to find for two reasons. Number one, we don't realize that the rook is actually now going to be better on e6, where it can target the king side, but also simply tactically our brains won't let us hang the pawn. But this is a key tactic in these kinds of positions. Rook end games do have tactics that are lots of these tricks that come up time and time again, uh, time and time again, as you analyze these positions. So black played rook to g8, trying to hold on, white goes rook to e6, and long story short, what he was able to do was advance his king, and actually advance his pawn to eventually uh, trade one off, leave himself with an extra g pawn, and this g pawn uh, was able to win the game for white. There was uh, different ways to win this position, white could also play a plan of um, moving the rook to d6 and trying to get the king in uh, this way. Uh, White's idea here was not the only way to, to break through, but I think it was pretty instructive. So g4 here, king goes back to h4, and now h6, so black doesn't take with check. White can simply uh, take back with the rook. And now white's idea at a certain point is to simply take on h7 and use the fact that black's king is so far away on the queen side that black will not be able to stop the g-pawn uh, in time. So I'll quickly show you guys the uh, conversion here because uh, I think it was pretty instructive. White goes rook to c7, allowing black to give a check and finally take the b6 pawn. But now when white takes on h7, again, the king is too far away and uh, black is simply not in time to defend against this one. And eventually we're going to be reaching uh, a simple Lucina endgame. Now, if you guys don't know how to win this kind of position, I would strongly, strongly recommend you look up a video and learn how to do it. I'll leave a link in the description uh, below because this is really one of the, basically the most important 
theoretical rook end game that you need to know is this kind of simple position how to win when you get your pawn all the way to the seventh rank but the defender is blocking your king off and not letting you uh, escape so here of course botvinnik uh, knows the method he he shows that he brings the rook to the fourth rank and starts building the bridge and uh, this game finishes with a a classic textbook uh, lucina bridge where black's king is too far away isn't able to reach the f7 square in time and because the king is too far away, then uh, of course white wins with the, the pass g pawn. Okay, so very important game uh, illustrating the importance of keeping the rook behind the pawn, but also the strategy of how to actually play and convert once you get this big advantage. This is generally considered to be, uh, supposed to be giving really good winning chances for the side that gets the rook behind the pass pawn. Uh, so definitely a game to play through multiple times and, and study very carefully. Okay, next guys, we have two really important endgames by the great Akiba Rubenstein. Uh, Rubenstein is known to be legendary, not just in endgames, but specifically Rook and Pawn endgames. He had a number of really good ones. Uh, this is a, a fairly simple example, but I think really, really interesting. This is his game against uh, Georg Salway. And um, this position starts with bishops on the board. These bishops are about to get traded off. But I like starting at this moment because uh, Rubenstein plays a Rook to G4 check, forcing the King to H8. And now takes on f8, rook takes f8, and leaves the king one tempo behind for the resulting rook endgame. So this, this attention to detail, I think, is really, really uh, important. And now the rook switches over to uh, the queen side with rook to a4. So here black goes rook to b8, and I think white's decision here is very, very interesting. I think a lot of players would simply play the move b3 here, myself included, and this is a completely uh, satisfactory move. The idea is simply to defend white's b-pawn and keep the pressure on the weakness on a7, forcing black to play rook to b7, and after something like rook a6, forcing black to play rook to c7, White would have a really, really big advantage here and, and should just be winning. Black has so many weaknesses. Basically, every single pawn in Black's position is a potential weakness. The way White wins this one is by bringing in the king, let's say, over to the c4 square. Black can, of course, defend with king to d6. But here, similar to the situation we saw in our first game with the game Marshall versus Shigorin, Black's pieces are just tied down to all of these weaknesses. Black can never go for a king and pawn end game because, again, there will be too many weaknesses to defend. And white can swing uh, the rook around, rook a5, rook h5, go after the king side pawn. This is basically the principle of two weaknesses here, kind of in perfect view. Uh, except in this case, black has like five weaknesses. So <laughs> this would be a completely winning position for white. I think white just mops, uh, mops it up here. But Rubenstein's decision is actually pretty interesting because he doesn't go the so-called technical route. He actually goes the direct route. He plays rook takes a7. So he allows black to take on b2, trading off some pawns. And generally trading pawns in a rook end game is going to be advantageous for the defender, who no longer has to defend as many weaknesses. But he's calculated here that he takes on f7, rook takes a2, now takes on f6. So white has won a pawn. But winning a pawn is not always decisive in rook end games, especially here. Black is the one with uh, past uh, c pawn on the queen side. All of white's pawns are on the king side. And here black goes rook to c2. And at face value, this would not be uh, an easy end game uh, to win, even though white has potentially two connected pass pawns on the king side. Black c pawn is going to be running very quickly, and white will have to pay attention to this pawn. So black will be getting some counterplay here with the c pawn. Uh, but Rubenstein either knew or he figured it out during the game that he can actually win this by force after the very important move rook to f7. So this is kind of the key move in this uh, entire example, rook f7, cutting the king off on the seventh rank. Now black's king is just going to be stuck on g8 here, and white can get behind the pawn and basically fulfill multiple purposes. We talked about the importance of getting the rook behind the pass pawn. Here it's kind of the defender that uh, gets to benefit. The rook will be defending against the pawn and restricting uh, the enemy king on the back rank. And this will allow white to simply advance his king and his pawns forward freely. And Rubenstein shows that actually this position is completely winning for white. And he's able to demonstrate a really, really nice plan uh, to end up winning this one. So I hope you guys uh, can, can learn from it. So black plays c5, uh, h4 h6. This move is not strictly uh, necessary, but if black does not play h6, then white is going to advance his own pawn to h6, and that's going to uh, lead to all kinds of issues for uh, black's king on the back rank. Uh, so black plays h6 to create some space. 
Now white goes king to g2, c4, king f3. And I really want to stress that this is not a trivial win for white. You really have to be uh, very delicate here. And the reason is, is that if black is ever able to trade this c pawn for one of white's kingside pawns, then white's extra pawn on the king side is going to be basically meaningless. Uh, these two versus one end games, one extra pawn, when the defending king is in front of our extra pawn, uh, the winning chances are basically zero. So white's only winning path here is to keep his three pawns on the king side all alive. Um, so c3, h5, white is keeping the king, defending the f pawn and not letting black trade off. Uh, and black is very smartly keeping the rook on the second rank here, not going down to c1 to kind of tie white's king to this f pawn. But it's simply not enough. King e3, king to g8. Now white advances g4. And now f3 is coming and then the rook is not going to be able to attack anything and the king is going to be able to walk in. So here we have f3, rook to c1. Uh, and now white walks in king to e4. This is kind of the final phase of the winning plan. This is actually dangerous because black pushes c2, threatening rook to e1 check. White gets out of the check. This does allow the move rook to f1, which black plays. And now if white were to take on c2, rook takes f3. Normally this would be kind of a drawish position, two versus one, but here white can go king to g6 and he's actually winning the second pawn uh, on the spot. Because of the threat of the back rank, black doesn't have time for any rook f4, rook g3 stuff, has to go rook to f8 here, white wins the second pawn on the king side, and that's game over, and, and black simply resigned here. So really, really nice uh, conversion, very, very accurate, nice transformation of the uh, advantage here. Um, white waits for the exact right moment to advance his king, and he runs towards this g6 square where black's king uh, is going to get attacked with mating threats and white can go after this uh, final h pawn and yeah this is simply a completely hopeless position for black i'd encourage you guys to play this one out if you're not exactly sure uh, how to win it i'm sure there's lots of videos on this one uh, as well but this is more in the range of theoretical rook end games and not so much uh, playable ones so yeah, very cool transformation by Rubenstein here. Rather than going with the simple b3, he ends up taking on a7, uh, trading off some pawns, but ending up with this position where his rook behind the c-pawn ends up being extremely dominant, and black basically being helpless to white's plan of advancing the king and advancing the kingside pawns. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you found it uh, instructive. If there are any games that you think uh, I should consider as being some of the most instructive rook end games of all time, please let me know in the comments and I'd be happy to check them out. And if you want like a part two to this video or you have another topic you want to see like the most instructive night end games or the most instructive bishop end games or what have you if you have any suggestions please feel free to let us know in the comment section below all right guys hope you have a good one and i'll catch you next time take care